It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Hey friends, today I'm joined by another of my favorite rose gardeners. Cindy Dell is here to tell us what she does in the spring to get her roses prepared for a summer of blooming in the deep south. Now, I don't know about you, but last summer when it got so, so very hot, I felt like I was living in the deep south, not the Midwest. So I'm going to be paying close attention to what Cindy has to say. Now, Cindy is not only a master rosarian in growing roses, but she and her husband have been knocking it out of the park at rose shows, winning some of the highest awards. So we'll be looking for some tips there, too. Well, there's a lot we want to chat about, so let's get started. Hey, Cindy, welcome back to Rose Chat. Hey, thanks for having me. So glad to have you. And do you remember our last Rose Chat together was in 2020? Wow. Things were different then. And that podcast dealt with your favorite hybrid tea roses, both the old classics and some of the newer hybrid teas. Yep. It was yep. a, uh-huh. yeah, it was really good. Friends, if you haven't listened to that chat or would like to listen to it again, just go back and find it on our homepage, Rose Chat Podcast. Dot com. Hybrid Teas with Cindy Dale. Now, Cindy, we love to hear the backstory. So let's just start with how you became interested in roses. Okay. I'm, I'm always glad to share this. I've, I've shared this about a thousand times and, and it's always kind of funny because, uh, in, um, let's see, uh, we moved here to, uh, just South of Atlanta, Peachtree city in, um, 1993. And two summers later, um, I decided that, uh, I wanted something to grow along the split rail fence that we have in the backyard. <laughs> and I went to the nursery and I was thinking about a vine, uh, like a clematis or, you know, something like that. And the, uh, salesman at the nursery uh pointed to this don juan rose and he says oh you need to have this this don juan here and i said no uh no i don't uh, i said I, I don't know anything about roses i, I can't do this uh, uh i was just petrified you know and he said well just get a couple of these books here read up on it and and do what it says and, and you'll be fine and i did and it just uh, thrived. In fact, I still have it. Um, it's now mm. 20 feet wide and 12 feet tall and covered um, most of the growing season with these beautiful, fragrant uh, red blooms. And uh, in fact, I even wrote an article um, for the um, American Rose Annual uh, that was titled My Love Affair with Don Juan. <laughs> because it really, <laughs> it really got me started. It did so well, and I, I just shudder to think what would have happened if it had not um, been so successful, you know. But, but of course, then, then I got the bug, and I had to keep adding and adding and adding, and um, you know, so that it, it kind of went from there. Well, that did spark something. So, tell us about all the sparks. How many are you growing now? 285. 285. Oh, that's my all. goodness. <laughs> that's all. I've seen pictures of your garden. Oh, my goodness. It's so beautiful. That Don Juan is so beautiful. I think the most I've ever had is 200. I have a lot less than that right now because I have a lot of other things, too. But it is beautiful. And it just looks like a beautiful garden. You really can't tell that there's 285, but I'm going to believe you on that one. Well, they're on all four sides of the house. We have a half an acre, and they're on all four sides of the house. And uh, I, I just uh, love the way my husband, he built this wonderful uh, trellis out of copper pipe that Don Juan oh. is attached to because it, it way outgrew that split rail fence a long time ago. <laughs> and so now we have this beautiful copper pipe uh 
trellis uh, um, above the the fence that that it is uh, I have it a spalier out to both sides and and like we know uh, climbers love to have their canes horizontal and you get a lot more blooms that way so it's just it really seems to love it its location. Oh, it does. And aren't we lucky to have these handy husbands who can build those things for us in our roses? For sure. For sure. I don't know what I'd do otherwise. <laughs> well, maybe you couldn't have 285, but your your no, garden no. just looks so, so gorgeous. Now, Thank tell you. us a little bit about the types of roses that are in that 285. Oh, all types. Um, not a lot of uh, old garden roses. Uh um, I haven't gotten so much into those, although I do have uh, Blush Noisette and uh, mm. Paul Neron. Those are my, my two favorites <laughs> there. Uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, all other types, uh, I think the hybrid teas are my favorite. Grand of Flora's, Florabundas, you can't beat them for um, the mass of blooms that they produce. Um, uh, minis, mini Flora's, I just love those so much. And uh, you know, especially the Dave Bang uh, striped ones now that, that he is uh, hybridizing climbers, shrubs, just all of them. What are some of the climbers you're growing? Not too many on those because they take up so much room. Uh, so in addition to the Don Juan, I have um, Night Owl and mm-hmm. I have Sombrui and uh, mm-hmm. Fourth of July. And that's all. Oh, those are pretty. Those are pretty. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think back to your last growing season, which I'm doing a lot of these days, what are some of your standouts? Well, Ring of Fire, the the Chris Greenwood uh, hybrid tea that came out a couple years ago is just fabulous. Uh, It's a good grower. It's that hot orange, and it's just, it seems like it's always in bloom. And I, well, I probably love it because it won the national queen for me um, in Shreveport <laughs> last year. <laughs> that rose was stunning. I ha- I happened to be there for that one. And that was stunning, as were so many of your roses. Beautiful rose. It's just almost perfection. Yeah, it kind of glows, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. But purple is my favorite color. And I'm just in love with the Floribunda's um, uh, Plum Perfect and uh, Celestial Night, and I've just added more of those to my garden uh, last year, so. That's music to my ears, because I'm getting ready to add Celestial Night. There's a couple of roses that I added last year, and I'm just giddy to see them come back for that second season that's so much more outstanding, and one of those is Plum Perfect, about three of those last year, and Bliss, so I cannot wait to see what they can do. They were so beautiful last year, and I can't wait to see what they can do the second year. So good news and, on uh, Celestial Nights. Yeah. That color is fabulous. Yeah. Oh, it really is. It really is. And that one, um, best in show at the our district uh, show last fall. Okay. Be careful here in this climate. Um, some of the David Austins can be black spot prone, but my absolute favorite there is uh, Princess Alexandra of Kent. Oh, I don't have that one. At least oh. not yet. But it is oh. a beauty. They've never, a lot of people have never heard of the dark lady. Have you ever heard of that one? I've seen it only in the, I think it was in the catalog or mm, I saw it somewhere, but, but you don't hear much about it. No, it's not uh, one of the bigger ones on the market right now, but it's that uh, really dark, almost burgundy um, bloom. And it's uh, named after uh, a character in, uh, in a Shakespeare uh, play and the reason I like it some of the um, David Austins don't bloom that much they have this huge spring bloom and then just scattered blooms you know here and there the rest of the growing season but the dark lady and Princess Alexandra um, seem to be uh, have a lot more blooms the rest the whole time Oh, so they make it all through the summer. Yeah, uh-huh. I was noticing the roses. I, I really took note of the roses. We had so much heat, and I know that's what you deal with all the time, but we had so much heat last year. I was really taking note of the roses that kept blooming, even though it was just so hot. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's my feeling that, that, that if you're going to put all this work into these roses, that, that I just want them to reward me with armloads of, of blooms if possible. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you talked a little bit about winning awards. So could you tell us just a little bit about uh, the hobby of Rose uh, exhibiting and how you guys got started? Sure. Um, so I told you about Don Juan and then adding a few more hybrid teas and things. And uh, probably about four years later, uh, they were doing really well. And I saw an um, article in the paper that talked about something called a Rose Show. And I called the number in there and uh I asked her all about that, and she told me just cut some long stems and bring them in a bucket of water to the show site, and we'll help you enter them, you know. And uh, so I did that, and uh, uh, I won in the novice. I think I won a, a fourth place ribbon, and I was just over the moon, you know. I, I thought I was the best exhibitor ever, you know. But that was enough to uh, to uh, give me the bug, you know. And and from then on, I was just addicted to it and 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 the thrill of it uh the thrill of um winning and not only that but being able to uh show our roses to the public and and uh, help them see what what it is that is out there and and how we can educate them about roses so i'm just um i love local district and uh national competitions and and um just uh, all aspects of exhibiting roses. Uh, it takes a little bit of extra extra work uh, because the judges get really picky about things like black spot on leaves and and uh, insect damage and and that type of thing. But uh, to me, it's just worth the thrill of getting up early in the morning and and turning up the air conditioning in the car and putting on my sweater and 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 traveling <laughs> with these buckets of of fragrant roses uh um to the to the show side i just it's such a thrill oh my goodness it, you know when you walk into the room um in like in streetport last year i mean when you just see the you know thousands of roses that you're just like you're just overwhelmed it is really beautiful what people can do now did you have any mentors that helped you along the way or did you just jump in with both feet oh no of course uh we all have uh mentors um on the local level, there was uh, Walt and Linda Reed, um, Jack mm -hmm. Haney, um, some of those. Uh, but and then on the district level, it was more like Bob and Sandy Lundberg and uh, and oh, even yeah. uh, Satish, Satish Prabhu. You know, I consider him uh, one of my mentors. And, and I remember being at a district show here in Atlanta, and I was in the prep area, and I had them uh, all – uh, staged in the vases, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and Satish came by and he says, oh, that one might be a little bit too tall. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I don't think so. But if Satish Prabhu says it's too tall, then it's too tall. And I put jammed it down and then lower in the vase. You know? <laughs> good thinking, good thinking. You know, we've all seen Satish's roses. Um, if you haven't, you can follow him on Facebook and see this. And, you know, he's had several beautiful, beautiful gardens and they are just amazing. And he mm -hmm. is so willing to help anyone. It's just yep. he even he even writes articles for Facebook so that you can get real time information from him. And so oh, I just appreciate them so much. Yeah, Just a yeah. wonderful, wonderful guy. Well, you had good mentors. You are lucky, girl. That was you had some really good mentors. Well, what helps me too is having a partner, having David, my husband, that that will put up with this craziness. And uh, uh, um, he he doesn't do the day to day care of the roses, but when it comes to exhibiting, he's such a team member, you know. And just uh, we have it down to a science when we get to the prep room. He does this, and I do that, and and it's just uh, working. It's just like clockwork. So that really helps too. You know, I love seeing that. You know, we've got Mark and Kathy, and we've got uh, uh, John and Donna Hefner, and just seeing them, you know, through the years, they've just been such teamwork because they both love the same thing. It is a beautiful thing to see and to see you guys, too. I mean, it is really a fun thing to see. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who thinks uh, that would be too hard to do? I would say uh, start out small. Um, most shows have a novice 
class, uh, and that's if you've never won a blue ribbon in an ARS sanctioned show. Um, and uh, so that's a great place to start. A lot of shows these days have a no spray uh, class that you can enter your roses in if you don't spray them. Um, my show, my South Metro Rose Society uh, here in Fayetteville, Georgia, we have a class um, that's called Small Gardens. And there's there's three actually cl uh, subclasses in that. If you have less than 50 roses, um, you can enter one for hybrid tea grandifloras, one for mini, mini floras, and one for everything else. Uh, and so you're not competing in those classes against the big dogs, you know, and, and it's a great way to get your uh, feet wet. And we also have a class that I just added last year for what we call decorative form blooms. And those are the ones that like from Cordes or Mayon that they have the roughly uh, centers, but they don't have the tall pointed center that, we consider mm -hmm. exhibition form and a lot more people are growing uh, the decorative form uh, roses. So we have now have a class for, uh, for those. And, and what else I would say would be um, there's a lot of articles about there on uh, how to, to exhibit uh, uh, what you need to do as far as uh, um, cleaning the leaves and getting them ready. And uh, I've written several of those. I wrote one of those for American Rose Magazine uh, last year in the um, uh, March-April issue. And it really took all the basics step-by-step step on uh, how to exhibit your roses. So those those type of things to, to read and, and to, to research um, are really wonderful. Which just uh, begs to mention that, you know, look for a local Rose Society because they're going to have access to those kinds of things for you too. probably people in that society, or they could get you hooked up to where you could find the information that you just mentioned. So um, the American Rose Society is rose.org or just look for a local society near you. So either the American Rose Society or a local Rose Society can get you all hooked up to that kind of information. Yep. Okay, Cindy, spring is coming. It, well, for you, it's probably here. So let's talk about some steps you take to get all those pretties ready to go. <laughs> Well, number one, we have to have our soil tested. Uh, you can't know what to add to, uh, to your soil until you know what you're starting with. So we have to take our soil samples um, to our county extension agent or uh, another private lab if you don't have a county extension agent and they will send it off probably to the nearest uh, college. In our case, it's uh, University of Georgia. It costs $9 for uh, a sample, and you get the report back uh, by email in about a week, and it gives you everything that's, that's going on. If you have too much or too little of the um, major or the minor elements, and it also tells you what to do about it. For instance, if your pH is too low, we know that roses like around 6.5 uh, pH, uh, which uh, allows them to take up the most nutrients. That, um, and if your pH is low, then it'll tell you to add lime, or if it's high, it'll tell you to add uh, sulfur. So we have to start from that basis. And uh, then we prune uh, whatever is the right time for your area. Uh, usually it's uh, six weeks uh, after the last uh, frost is predicted. Um, once you prune everything, then you can uh, pull back your mulch around the bushes and you can apply your different uh, soil amendments. I use uh, three organic amendments, black cow, cow manure, mushroom compost, and Mills Magic Rose Mix, which is a mixture of eight different organics already mixed into it. And then I also add um, a cup of synthetic uh, granular fertilizer because we know that the organics don't have uh, uh, really high levels of the, the nutrients that the roses might need. So the, the synthetic 
uh, fertilizer helps uh, supplement that and give them the, the the energy they need to put out those gorgeous spring blooms. Um, so then uh, I use I have so many uh, roses that I add I have the Dripworks um, water emitters and I have to to turn on the system and replace the clogged ones and. And then we, we replace with fresh pine straw. That's what I use for mulch, but it doesn't really matter. You can use a lot of different things for mulch. The final thing that I do is replace all of the engraved uh, markers in front of them. Now, what markers do you recommend? Uh, I've, I've seen on Facebook so many people are asking for different resources for markers. So I know that's a big deal right now. I use and have used for years uh, ones by... Um, triple a quality engravers and those are in the back of american rose magazine they're one of the uh, advertisers um Mm -hmm. and and they're um they're black with white engraving and they come on a a metal stake and uh, i like them because the engraving doesn't fade uh in the sun or the weather it just just lasts and lasts um the people who visit your garden appreciate that so much because, you know, when, when we have guests to our garden or an open garden, you have so many questions. You're looking around and you might forget the name of a rose and people want to know what rose they're looking at. So I think that's so helpful, to, especially to guests who come. And I would say around here for pruning, I know it's different in every area, but we, um, if forsythia grows in your area, uh, we watch for the forsythia to grow because that tells us that the ground has warmed up to about 50 degrees. And so it doesn't always work, but that's that's what we look for um, that's going on around us, you know, kind of following yep. nature. And so that's when we prune. And I did forget to mention that the, that after applying these organics and the uh, then the synthetic fertilizer that is lightly scratched in, you know, we don't just leave it there in a in a lump. We, we scratch it into... Uh, to the soil a little bit. And then I, I add preen on the top of that as a, uh, a weed pre-emergent. Yep, taking care of all of that. And I'm sure you probably then water um, after you get all that down so it can get down oh, to yeah. its business. For sure. <laughs> get, get the water in there. Okay, so you deal with, you're in the deep south and I know you deal with pests and diseases. So let's talk about diseases. I know black spot's probably the worst and maybe some powdery uh-huh. mildew. At least that's what happens here uh, if we get if we get a deep south summer. Yeah, black spot is our main uh, scourge here uh, and some powdery mildew in the, uh, the spring and the fall when you have your uh, warm days and cool nights. We don't get the rust uh, like they do on the West Coast, um, but but we do get very bad black spot. I spray, especially exhibiting my roses, I spray, uh, I have a, a um, chemical um, program that I rotate on a weekly basis um, between three different fungicides. You know, really, uh, I, I respect the fact that there's a lot of people out there that don't want to spray these days and I completely understand that and and nobody is saying that you you need to but if that's the case then you really need to be growing the newest roses on the market that are more and more disease free and the the hybridizers understand that that there's a lot of people that don't want to spray so they're coming out with more and more um, uh, disease resistant roses all the time that that look like real roses and have fragrance and uh, two of those uh, my favorites in that category that I always feel about is our Beverly and Savannah and those are both by Cordes and they're they're uh, huge pink blossoms that are uh, have deep deep fragrance and um, so uh, whenever I give a rose program I always have several slides showing the the newest on the the easy care or disease resistant roses if, if people don't want to spray. But it's black spot with this heat and humidity here in my area is is so prevalent that uh, otherwise we're, we're just going to get uh, covered up with, with black spot. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I'm a great leaf picker and uh, I have gone to a lot of the new ones because there's just so many pretty ones now. Um, Not as many hybrid teas, although you did name two of the two of the outstanding ones in Savannah and Beverly, but there's so many pretty roses. I mean, the hybridizers are really working hard and we've got some pretty and fragrant roses that just don't need as much attention. And that's great. It's wonderful to have those perfect ones too. And so, you know, we want a balance of all of that, but, but uh, I'm a great leaf picker and a spot treater. So that's kind of how I do it. I, I'm not one for a lot of regimen, but, but, as you know, I have exhibited and do occasion. And I love those um, categories that you described where um, those, those are very welcome. And uh, so there is a place for all of us in uh, the Rose Kingdom for sure. And uh, let's talk about insects uh, for, for a bit. Of course, we're talking about spider mites and thrip and aphids and Japanese beetles. Um, and uh, even though I do exhibit, I do not spray preventatively for insects. Uh, as we know, uh, it's best uh, to only spray for insects if there's a specific pest that you can identify and that you cannot tolerate. Because otherwise, mm-hmm. over spraying with insecticides, you're going to kill your beneficial bugs. And, and uh, then you have... Uh, open yourself more to spider mite damage, and uh, we just don't want to to kill our beneficial bugs. So um, even though I have this very strict fungicidal spray program, I do not mm-hmm. uh, sp- spray preventatively uh, for for insects. But I get all, asked all the time about Japanese beetles in my programs, and I tell them, well, in this climate, they're here for about eight weeks and then they're gone so if you can just tolerate them uh, for that short amount of time and I walk around make rounds through the garden uh, with a jar of soapy water and I just knock them in there and I call it my beetle swimming pool and uh, they Mm -hmm. I I invite them in for a swim and and they never come out you know People and, you know, it makes a pretty little bucket because all the petals, you know, fall in with them and it all looks pretty. So you're sending them off in a beautiful bucket. And people ask me, well, what about the beetle traps? And I said, no, 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 because you're attracting them from uh, all over the neighborhood if you put up these beetle traps, you know. So I, I don't uh, reckon, recommend those at all, you know. Probably want to say a word here about Rose Rosette you know, um, because that, that's a big deal these days. And it, it seems to make people very afraid and, uh, go out and start ripping up their roses. And, and, uh, uh, there's a wonderful website, roserosette.org that people really should go to because online I'm seeing crazy, um, things. Um, but as we know, Rose Rosette, is a virus that is transmitted by windborne mites. And uh, it looks, it gives you that witch's broom, purplish, reddish growth with lots and lots of thorn. And uh, there's no treatment for it once the bush um, uh, has it. You really have to dig it up all the way down to the roots. And uh, then I've, I've been seeing various sources that say how soon you can plant in that hole again. I think the latest source that I saw was two months uh, and uh, but there's there's things on the internet I'll like you know spray it with this or spray it with that and there's not a lot of um, scientific basis uh, to that they're working on it very very hard uh, Mark Windham Dr. Mark Windham and and his group are doing a lot of research on Rose Rosette yeah, you know, we had Dr. Byrne on Mark and Dr. Byrne and David Slezak. They're all just, we have a fabulous team working on that. And while they're working on that, they're also working on um, fungal diseases, trying to, um, you know, give us more uh, tips and tools for um, uh, dealing with that as well as um um, disease resistant roses when it comes to that. So, so we've got, you know, some good grants and some good things going on there. And I've grown a lot of roses through the years, a lot of roses and very little 
trouble with Rose Rosette. So don't be afraid of it. It is going to happen. You know, it's just we live in an imperfect world. But and if you see it, dig it, dispose of it. And then in a little bit, you know, plant another rose. There's so many beautiful ones. Sometimes I just give away a pretty rose because I want a different rose and I only have room for so many. So there's so many choices. Don't be afraid. Um, Just get rid of it. And um, do you guys have deer down there? I just have to ask. Oh, of course we do. Are you bothered by deer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Deer Uh, are making me crazy. Oh, I know. Me too. Me too. Uh, I wish that I was allowed to use electric fence, but I'm not uh, in in the town here. Um, But we do have the fencing that we're allowed to use. And then um, the foliage spray that I like to put on there that I've had the best results with is called liquid fence. And and that's uh, putrefied eggs and garlic. And it smells awful when you're putting it on, spraying it on the foliage. But once it dries, you can't smell it. But the deer Mm -hmm. and the rabbits can. And hopefully it lasts about three weeks. But you might have to reapply after um, a heavy rain. Uh, So that's, that's how I deal with deer. Well, that, that's good. We've used a couple of products, too. We've just had so many that we just couldn't keep them all out. Last year was our worst year by far. This year, it has been easier. Um, I, I put up some fencing and some kind of makeshift things around the, some of the roses that are um, out where they're just, you know, very easy to get to. But boy, the deer, they just like the roses, too. And the deer are beautiful, but I just want them to find something else to eat. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And some people talk about uh, tying a fishing line uh, up at at various heights, you know, um, Mm -hmm. uh, um, that that uh, I guess some people have had good results with that. And uh, there's all kinds of things out there on the market, sonic um, things. And then there's the uh, Mm -hmm. one, the water uh, sprays that come on their motion activated water sprays and uh, all kinds of things. Oh my goodness. I mean, they get used to it. Last fall, it was really comical because I was asking Greg, have you seen this trellis or have you seen this? And I was just gathering up all of this stuff and we had some, you know, A-frame trellises and we had some, um, some obelisk we weren't using and I gathered them all up and started just placing them, you know, at random, what it looked like random in the garden. And he said, what are you doing? And I go, I'm trying to at least aggravate the deer. (laughs) So (laughs) at least they're going to bump into something. So it's looked a little funny out there. I can't really see it that well from the window. So it's okay. But it was funny, but you know, there's a, you know, there's still areas that they've, they've, you know, munched, but it it did, it did aggravate them, I think, enough that we don't have quite the damage we've had before. (laughs) Well, that's, that's good. Uh, I know that they were here first and all that stuff, but uh, they're, they're. Um, natural predators are basically gone, you know, and, uh, Mm -hmm. and I heard read somewhere that uh, without any type of control uh, that their herd doubles in size every three years. Oh, yeah. Yep. We see a lot of them around here. Now I'm wondering uh, with your weather conditions and it got so hot last year, are there things that you do differently to deal with that? Um, not really, uh, just lots and lots of watering. Um, and of course that's, uh, uh, down by the roots. Uh, I try not to overhead water. Um, or if I did, it would just, um, I would make sure that the leaves dried off before sunset because we know that the wet foliage harbors, uh, the diseases, um, so a couple times uh, uh, during the summer, I might give them a nice refreshing shower uh, with uh, some watering of the foliage. But um, most of the time, it's my drip system uh, down by the, the roots for the watering. Um, I do uh, spray like we talked about once a week. Um, I plant them uh, uh, three to four feet apart for good air circulation. Um and uh, I, like you talked about, early removal of any infected leaves. And I mm-hmm. would 
caution people not to drop those infected leaves on the ground like I used to do when I was uh, a beginner, you know. So we want to mm -hmm. put those infected leaves in the trash. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, that, that's probably about it. Well, that sounds good. Um, one of the things about those leaves, I remember the day I learned that you don't leave them at all because nothing about your winter, even though we were having horrible winters then, nothing about your winter is going to kill those little spores. They're going to be there to greet you next year. So sanitation is really important when you, if you do have those fungal diseases, you know, picking those leaves and disposing of them and let them be gone completely right gone. right and then uh, dormant spraying is good too with volk oil or um, lime sulfur um, to mm -hmm. helps helps kill those uh, overwintering insect eggs and and uh, spores yeah we, that is one thing that we're very consistent with. We do a dormant spray. We'll probably do that two times. And I think that has helped us so much just to get a handle on what was wintered over. And, you know, if you have a, a mild winter and, and it, I think that does just kind of level the playing field for the new year and, and who knows what that's going to bring. But um, but I think that that is one of the most valuable things we can do. And that's, you know, they do in the orchards and all of that. And they talk about how important, you know, it is to the crop of anything is those dormant sprays um, really are important. And there's a lot of things out now. And I would say to people, don't forget to read the um, instructions because you know your conditions better than anyone and just read what they say because it's not one size fits all at all and there's so many products out now some really good products out there um, and um, so just take a look when you look at Lowe's it's a little bit overwhelming there's so many things there but take a look and see what's best for you and your conditions because um, it really isn't one size fits all Absolutely. And when we're using any type of chemicals, we obviously want to uh, read and follow the label directions with those. And, and we want to be wearing our uh, protective um, equipment, um, such as uh, nitrile gloves, um, uh, mask, um, you know, the uh, rubber uh, boots, maybe things like that, that, that will help us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, absolutely. You know, even things that are organic, it's not like you really want breathe, to breathe in those kinds of things um, either. So um, we want to be uh, mindful of all of those things, even whether it's organic or inorganic. It's, it, we want to protect ourselves from those kinds of things. Oh, you know what? We're deadheaded all through the growing season. Um, when the bloom becomes past its prime, you don't want to leave it on the bush because then that signals the bush that, that its work is done. So I go down to the uh, first five leaflet leaf. Uh, that is a leaf that has five little leaflets coming out of it. And I make my cut above that. Or if you want, uh, uh, you can go further down if you want to. But uh, uh, that seems to be where you get the fastest uh, regrowth, if you will, deadhead, take off those uh, dead blooms. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and she's talking primarily about hybrid teas and the minis and mini floras. If you have shrub roses or ground cover roses or even um, um, some of the, the roses that um, uh, new roses we see today, there's a lot of them and they look so beautiful. It's hard to just call them just a shrub. But a lot of those roses, um, some of them will be say they will say that they're self cleaning, and that means you really don't have to um, to to prune those dead leaves off at all because they're they're sterile and not going to make seeds, and it's not they're going to keep blooming regardless. I still do because I just want to keep them tidy, or maybe I want to just control their growth a bit or shape them up a little bit for the the setting that I have them in, but. Um, we, I think always with all the roses, it's just a good practice to kind of keep the center cleared out just because of that, of uh, airflow, uh, like Cindy talked about, because, you know, bugs like to gather, you know, where they have a cozy spot. So just thinning a bit is helpful and uh, just keeping the, the center out and, and things moving a little bit helps, I think, with any rose that you grow. But um, but definitely, if you're trying to grow, you know, the, the hyper teas, you know, definitely you want to um, to do that sort of shaping. And, and I think looking for that outward facing bud, once you get into it and you're looking at your rose, you're thinking, oh, 
if I do this, it's going to grow out, you know, leaving the middle open. Or if I do this, it's going to grow inside. So just little things like that as you're observing your rows, you kind of see, oh, I see how it's growing. And if things are all crossed up in the middle, well, that's, you know, you can just kind of prune those out. And other things I think I look for, especially in the shrub rows, is there anything that's just kind of dinky? You know, we've got dead or damaged right. or, you know, dying. Right. But we also have dinky. I think it was Gay yeah. Hammond that first said the word dinky because uh -huh. it's a little bitty, you know, if you've got a big, you know, hybrid tea and it's a little bitty cane, it's probably not going to be able to produce the big bloom that you want. So kind of getting those out of the way makes way for the bigger and the better, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, it sounds like a lot to do, but when you're just looking at, you know, your shrub and you're not going to have, you know, over 200 or even 120 like I do, you just uh -huh. look at it and you're, you're the mom, you know, you, you get to say, or the dad, you get to say how I want you to look, how I want to shape you. And I want to, you know, get you all ready for your, your big season. So it's just fun to look at and, and take a little bit of care and it's going to reward you let me tell you that's what i talk about when i talk about pruning i said uh we're going to control the bush uh it's not going to control us <laughs> Absolutely. And then we get our reward, whether we show it and win an award like you've been doing so much of, or we get to share it with a friend or just put it on our dining room table or, you know, on our table for dinner. It's just so much fun to be able to look out at your garden and see all those blooms or bring them in and get them up close and personal with them. It's perfect. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for being with me today. This has been so fun. We haven't got to see each other for almost a year. And it just was great to catch up. And I feel like I've got a power boost on the rosy season to come. Yeah. So thanks so much, Cindy. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, it's been great. And friends, I hope you heard some things today that can help you in your garden as you get ready to have your growing season. Or maybe you heard something that makes you want to try showing off your roses at a rose show. So grab a friend, check out a rose show near you. Check out um, the American Rose Society at uh, a, a rose, it's just rose.org, or look for a local society near you. There will be so many people there to help you. So spring is coming. It's going to be wonderful. We can't wait for those blooms. But until next time, friends, happy gardening. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.